Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 169 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we chat with John Lonsdale of Edgewood Gardens, all about cyclamen. The plant profile is on arugula, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with the last word on hostas by Christy Page at the Food Gardening Network. This episode, we're joined by John Lonsdale. He is the owner of Edgewood Gardens in Exton, Pennsylvania. And welcome, John. Thank you very much, Kathy. So we're going to be talking to you all about cyclamen and especially those really cute little miniatures and rare versions and how we can get them to grow best in our own gardens. But before we dive into all that, we like to ask our guests here at the Garden DC podcast, were they born with chlorophyll in their veins and a green thumb? Okay, well, I was born and raised in Sheffield in Yorkshire in the north of England. Um, I lived there until I was 35 years old, but uh, my mum was a gardener. She, she loved gardening, uh, not so much my dad. So when I was young, I was dragged around a lot of garden centers with her, but never really got gardening at all. Um, until I moved to Dorking in Surrey when I got my uh, PhD in 1984, I guess. And I got a, a brand new, very small house with a tiny garden. And my first memory there is putting down uh, a small lawn. I got some sod and put down a small lawn. And I guess that's kind of ironic because we have an acre and a half here now and we don't have a single blade of grass on it. But, uh, <laughs> I do remember that, and I remember buying, buying some crocosmias. Um, I love the orange flowers late in the summer, um, maybe even into the fall. And I, I think that was kind of a, an indicator of, of things to come because I, um, I especially love fall flowering plants. But that was really when I got going in about 1984 um, in the southeast of England. And then, so how did you end up in Exton, Pennsylvania? So I, my, my PhD is in microbiology, microbial biochemistry. And when I graduated, I got a job working at, it was Beecham back then, it's now um, GlaxoSmithKline. And I started working in microbiology research. And I guess in 2002, um, Smithline Beecham decided to close down the facility in the United Kingdom and offered 22 of us the opportunity to move to the United States. And uh, there was basically no job in England or a fantastic opportunity in the, in the United States. So we came over and uh, we're here now. It was interesting because we, we had my wife and the two children we had at the time. We came over in July 1995 to look at a house, find a house. We had six days to find a school district, find a house, sign a contract and go back to England. So it's, uh, we're, we're lucky we're still in the same house now in the same garden, but it's, it's not something I would choose to go through again. Wow, that is a quick timing. Yeah. And so was the house the deciding factor, the school district or the garden itself? So it was the, unfortunately the garden was the last thing on my mind. Um, mm. So we had a consultant who helped us choose a school district and then a realtor who found us a bunch of houses within the school district. And we started looking at those and the first hurdle we had to get over was to persuade the kids that we were not getting a house with a pool. So <laughs> one, once we managed that, we found the house that we're in now, which was about two months away from being finished. So we could have some input into the house and uh, we, we loved it. We loved the where it is in Chester County. And to be honest, I didn't really give the garden any thought at all because there was so much going on. Um, so, you know, we're doubly lucky that we're still in the house 29 years later. We love the house and, and the garden 
has been perfect for what I've wanted to do. And describe that journey of the garden going from uh, afterthought to building it into actual nursery business today. Well, it's kind of, it, it was an interesting journey because coming over here, I knew really very little about the climate, um, how hot it got, how cold it got, how horribly humid it was in summer. Um, and a lot of the plants that I grew in England, I grew in pots in alpine houses. They needed it cool, no humidity. Um, and I quickly realized that the primulas and the androsuses and the dionysses and things I grew in England were never going to grow here. So I would have to kind of kick off from scratch. Apart from the cyclamen that I grew in England, um, they were one of the first things that I started growing. And I still grow them now. So that's probably the only... Uh, plant genus that I've grown consistently for 40 years. But I always had an interest in trilliums and woodland plants, and we're lucky we have an acre and a half here, and part of it is sun, but most of it is deciduous woodland. So that kind of guided me along the way. Um, I put a hoop house up. We, we came to the U.S. in September 95, and by Thanksgiving 95, uh, we could be fine putting a hoop house up in the garden. And then I've put three greenhouses up since then, and I have four cold frames. So um, the greenhouses, unlike in England where I grow all my plants, they're really used for propagation and for the cyclamen that I can't grow in the garden, and also for an extensive snowdrop collection that I have. Um, but my, my real focus was to try to get plants into the garden to develop a garden. In England, the rarer the plant that I got, the faster I wanted to put it in a pot to so-called protect it. Once we came over here, the rarer the plant that I got, the faster I wanted to get it into the garden to really start challenging the garden and, and challenging the plants and pushing its own limits um, and learning to garden over here. It was, it was scary because, again, the, the compost that I used to use in England didn't exist over here. Um, everything was different, so I just kind of had to reinvent that network. Um, talk to nurserymen and find out what they did. At this point, it was still um, just a hobby. Um, so I got that going and uh, folks started sending me seeds from England and, and well, and then here we are now. So it's, I've obviously been working all the way through up until I retired just this year. So the, the gardening was very much a parallel, um, not so much a hobby as an obsession, but it kept me sane. I, I had a really good career, um, really enjoyed myself and managed to do the gardening in parallel. And now I'm, uh, I'm free to continue to develop the nursery and, uh, and go from there. Hmm. And I was lucky enough to visit um, during the Garden Bloggers Fling uh, several weeks ago. And so you have three greenhouses, mm -hmm. uh, or they hoop houses still, um, where you're growing in, plus, of course, all of the surrounding garden area. That's right. Yeah, they're, they're actually three greenhouses. So they're regular greenhouses with um, no windows, which my alpine houses had in the UK, but they, they obviously have intake shutters and exhaust fans. So they're, they're regular um, polycarbonate greenhouses. The first one I put up in 1996, and uh, the last one I just put up a couple of years ago to replace one that a tree fell on in uh, in, in 2021. So they're, they're heated, but the whole point of the greenhouses is to keep them as cool as possible without them freezing because the plants that I grow in there, uh, most of them will take some freezing, but some of them do not want to freeze. So I give them as much air and ventilation as I possibly can. And then when the temperature outside drops below freezing, the shutters close and two of them have gas, mains gas heaters in them. And one has an electric heater, but they, they, when they come on, they just boost the temperature up to no more than 34 or 35 degrees, and then they switch off. So the trick is to not use them as orchid greenhouses, but to use them um, to keep the plants as light and as cool as I can. And then they grow in character. It keeps the pests and diseases down, and, and everybody's happy. And for those who are listening, when we describe the greenhouses, they're about the size of, I would say, a small RV. You know, yeah, they're in minivan. Uh, two of them are 20 foot by 15 foot, and one of them is just a 12 by 8. So I think it's a total of 
something like 600 square feet of greenhouse space. But it's, it's very tightly packed. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And we'll get onto the subject of cyclamen in a minute, but they are, you know, small, relatively small plants, not like growing some large palms or things like that. So you can pack many, many, many in. And yeah. so let's talk a little bit about the soil and the geography of your acre and a half garden. So is it heavy rock, clay, a combination? And I think you have a sharp slope off that driveway. We do. That, that's right. So we're, <clears throat> we're on the south facing side of the Great Valley, which runs out um, to the west from Philadelphia. We're about 35 miles west of Philadelphia. And we're on the south facing slope. And we're probably about 300 feet above the valley floor. So that really gets straight to the, the key thing that almost all of the plants that I grow need, and that's good drainage. So not without even considering the soil, we never have standing water because whenever it rains, it always runs down into, uh, down towards the valley. Um, we, the, the garden faces south, um, there is a slope about 400 feet long and about 60 feet high across the whole of the um, across the whole of the garden, and it's fairly steep. When we moved in here, one of our neighbours said she was looking forward to a heavy rain to see if the plants that were at the top of the slope ended up at the bottom of the slope, and that got me a little bit worried. But it's fortunately it's never happened. Um, but the uh, and the garden itself, the soil, we have a little bit of clay at the bottom of the garden, but most of it is extremely well drained. It's, it is very rocky, so as soon as you put a shovel in the ground, um, it makes digging big holes difficult. Um, but at the same time, it adds to the adds to the drainage. Um, I leave the leaves at the top of the hill. I leave the leaves uh, on the on the garden on the slope, and at the bottom of the hill, I blow them down every fall, put them through a shredder, and put them back, which really helps to uh, improve the quality of the soil. Uh, trees are mainly red and white oaks, um, hickories, beeches, tulip poplars. They're the large trees. I've planted a lot of witch hazels, magnolias, redbuds, dogwoods, and also probably 50 or 60 native azaleas, which once they're established, really love the slope. Uh, we're about pH 6.5, so <clears throat> just a little bit acid. We get about two feet of snow in a normal winter, although last winter, for example, we didn't get any snow. Uh, about 48 inches of rain in a, a normal summer. Um, so really not a whole lot different to the, the climate down in, in DC. We're zone 6B, so the, our minimum winter temperature has been minus 5 Fahrenheit, which we've hit a few times. Yeah, and I thought that that slope was perfect for all those little bulbs that you have, um, not mm. just the cyclamen, but also, of course, the galanthus and other collector bulbs right. you have in there. Right. And, and the other other great thing about a slope is a lot of uh, a lot of plants, especially as the slope is facing south, they face their flowers down slope. So as you're walking along the slope or up the slope, if you have a lot of hellebores or trilliums or things like that. They're all facing the flowers down into you as you're looking up the as you're looking up the hill. So it, it really is a big advantage, mm -hmm. especially for those hellebores that just love to face down, right? Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes. And you're like, uh, I either have to cut them and float them in a bowl to see these blooms, or put a stick. And I've seen people do it with the trilliums, especially take a little right. stick and prop them up to face up. Right. Right, and and even the dwarf bulbs like the dog's tooth violets, the you know the epimed uh, the erythroniums, mm -hmm. they all tend to face south as well. So it's uh, I think the only downside is as I get older, um, I'm probably likely to be the one that rolls down the hill, but uh, mm -hmm. or, or struggles to get up it. But hopefully for a good few years yet, it'll uh, it, it's been a real bonus having that slope, and and it really mimics the conditions that a lot of these plants grow on in the wild. I mean, you go in, down into the deep south and look at trilliums, you go to Greece and Turkey and look at cyclamen and snowdrops. They're all growing on slopes. They're all growing on the banks of gullies. So it's, um, it's a great way to mimic natural habitat. Mm -hmm. And 10 times better than having to mow it. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, 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 
when we moved in, the uh, you know, obviously the builder had put in a whole bunch of um, funky evergreen shrubs and euonymus burning bushes, and there was grass everywhere. And I probably mowed it for about 10 years and then got Eleanor, my wife's permission to start um, eating into it. And then we got rid of the last blade of grass about 10 years ago and uh, gave my son-in-law the lawnmower and it was, it was a great day. That is a day to celebrate. Yeah. And <laughs> I was just going to say, you said downside of the slope and I thought that was a in, intended pun, but uh, I think that would be a great name for an article or something sometime. Um, yeah. The up the upside and downside of the slope. Exactly, yes. And there is a downside. I remember watching my mother-in-law make it largely from top to bottom without actually having her feet on the ground. She survived. She was fine. But it was uh, it, it definitely uh, gave an inkling of things that could be to come. <laughs> oh, yikes. Yeah. <laughs> definitely be careful there. Yeah. So um, let's turn to our topic of the hour, which is are cyclamen or cyclamen? And that's going to be my first question for you, John, is I've been saying cyclamen with the CY emphasis, and I think you're saying cyclamen. Um, so which is correct or are both correct or it doesn't matter at all? So they're both correct and it doesn't matter at all. Um, in England, you're quite right. I um, call them cyclamen. Um, come into the States, I noticed everybody calls them cyclamen. Uh, it really doesn't matter as long as we all know exactly what we're talking about. It's like Corydalis and Corydalis and Camellia and Camellia. I think the the international communities all know what they're talking about. And uh, it's really only when you get into talking about common names that I think you can get tripped up. So uh, Cyclamen is fine. Cyclamen is fine. Hmm. And are there common names? I, I've only ever heard them referred to as Cyclamen or Cyclamen. So, not. I think there is one that I've heard, which is called sow bread, S O W bread, which I would guess refer to the fact that in the wild, probably in in France um, and, and that part of Europe, there are a lot of wild pigs and wild hogs, and I'm guessing that they may eat, may eat the tubers because they're very starchy. Hmm. But yes, sow bread is the only. Um, the only common name that I've really come across. And I don't think you're likely to hear that in the, in the United States. Yeah, I've never heard that one. Yeah. And nor did I know that their bulbs were edible. Are they edible for humans too? I don't know of anybody that's, that's eaten them. They're, they're tubers. They, they often get called corns, um, but they're actually botanically they're tubers. And no, I don't know of anybody that's tried to eat them. I certainly haven't. <laughs> and probably not at those price points. No, no. <laughs> no. Hmm. So let's talk about um, some of the different species. And are you collecting all the available species and how many are there worldwide? So the genus Cyclamen is like every other genus. It, people divide and split and lump. But I would, I would say there are somewhere in the region of 23 species. So it's not a huge genus. Um, each of the species is reasonably distinct and they're divided. Some of them are, are just standalone species. Some are divided into two or three subspecies or varieties. Um, so it's fairly easy to get um, get a handle on the, on the nomenclature. Um, yeah, somewhere in the region of 23. And of those, I would say, well, I grow everyone except one. There's a species called Cyclamen somalense, which as the name would imply was found in the mountains of Somalia in North Africa quite a long time ago, maybe 40 years ago. And I think there are two or three tubers in cultivation in a Swedish botanic garden, but they're the only ones in cultivation. And because it's such a um, war-torn hard part of the world to get into, nobody's ever been and collected them since that original collection. But I grow all of the other species and subspecies uh, apart from Cyclamen somalens. And I would say where we are um, in this Zone 6B garden, somewhere in the region of 10 to 12 of those are reliably hardy in the garden here, as long as you get the conditions right. 
Um, once you get down to into zone seven, once you get south of DC, I've got friends in Alexandria that, that grow several species, which especially Sycamore Draken, which is a fabulous species, they can grow those in slightly protected areas in the garden, which is something that I can't do here. So you don't really have to go too far south of here to be able to grow the bulk of the genus in the garden. Hmm. And that was Cyclamen Graecum, so that's G-R-A-E-C-U-M? That's correct, yes. There's Graecum, subspecies Graecum, there's Graecum subspecies Candicum, and what used to be Graecum subspecies Anatolicum, which is now Cyclamen Maritimum. Um, and they have the most unbelievable leaves. The flowers are gorgeous, but they all flower in the fall. Um, but the leaves are absolutely incredible. I would love to be able to grow them here, and I've tried. And if we have a run of two or three mild winters, they, they will persist. Um, but as soon as we hit a cold winter, you know, if, say if we get below, I don't know, 10 degrees for very long, that's, um, that's what kills them. Yeah. I was looking at the Latin and seeing that that was, they're originating in Southern Greece um, or Crete. So that kind of tells you right there, their hardiness. That's right, right. Although the Crete especially is, um, has some fairly high mountains. Um, there's a good number of crocuses. There's, a, there's quite a few plants that are endemic to Crete, which are hardy in the garden here. So um, if, if anybody ever gets an opportunity to go to Crete or you've never been, um, you, you should absolutely take it up. It's a beautiful place. I say there's, uh, there's beaches and then you can go up onto the Amalas plateau and uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous place to visit and then in Greece a lot of the uh, a lot of the cyclamen you find them on the Greek islands uh, but especially you find them on the Peloponnese in southern Greece um, and if you want to go there in the fall you'd see Galanthus regini olgi, Galanthus pesmenei and acres and acres and acres of, of absolutely gorgeous cyclamen. Mm, sounds wonderful. And so you did allude there to my next question, which was, I know that a lot of cyclamen collectors are doing so for the foliage or the leaf patterns versus right. the flowers. Like the flowers are considered a bonus, which right. seems counterintuitive to me. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, um, it's a good point. And it, it is absolutely true because um, the flowers of most cyclamen vary from pure white through a nice pale pink to a deep pink but there's not a tremendous amount of variation that is until recently when the red forms of cyclamen heterofolium and the deep deep purple forms of cyclamen heterofolium were found they they are absolutely grown for the flowers but um you're right with the the main fall flowering species cyclamen heterofolium the leaves and the, and the diversity the variation is really infinite um, that is grown for the leaves. And then the spring flowering one, Cyclamen Coo, uh, doesn't quite have the same diversity of leaves, but they're still incredible. And the thing that really drives it is they're in flower. Heterofolium is in flower in my garden now. Uh, it starts flowering late September, and the flowers will go right through to the end of October. So it's in flower for four to six weeks. And it looks absolutely gorgeous when it's in flower. But then at the beginning of November, it starts to make the leaves. And through November, the leaves are all coming off the trees. All the herbaceous plants in the garden are dying down or being cleared up. And really, my slope goes from being covered in green to being fairly bare, apart from the cyclamen heterofolium. And we have probably 20 to 25,000 plants on our slope. And if you look out of our bay window downstairs or look out of the bathroom window or just take a walk around on the slope from beginning of November through to May, all you see is this unbelievable uh, ground cover, this carpet of, of cyclamen leaves. It's, uh, it's just amazing. And then come the spring, everything else just starts pushing through it. So even though the, the whole garden is covered in cyclamen, they don't, they're not aggressive. They play nicely with everything. So the leaves are the high point. Um, and, and that's what I've been selecting for for the last 35 or 40 years. Um, but the flowers are beautiful. And the flowers obviously come at the end of summer, early fall. And that's 
that's my favorite time of year. I don't like summer. I'm English. I, I don't like heat and humidity. I sweat too much. So when I see the cyclamen, I know it's all over for another year. Hmm. And so most people are used to, I would call it a florist cyclamen uh -huh. that they yep. might buy at a plant store or at the supermarket. And so first the flowers come up, then the leaves emerge, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. And then flowers die back then the leaves die back and then the person who's purchased it or got it as a gift assumes it's dead and then they Correct. check it. Yes. So, and, and that really leads to one thing that I need to emphasize is that cyclamen need good drainage. Um, most of the species except one, which we can talk about later, cyclamen purpurescens, they start growing in the fall, they stop growing in late spring and they want a, they disappear in the summer and they want a dry summer with excellent drainage. They'll, they'll take storms, they'll take rain. They don't want to grow somewhere where you put your sprinkler on every week to cover the grass and then the edge of the, the beds or whatever gets, gets wet every week. No cyclamen will rot. Um, but the florist cyclamen, that's exactly what people do. They enjoy the flowers, they enjoy the leaves, and then as it starts to heat up even in the house, the leaves start to yellow and they will start to wilt a little bit. And people think, as you said, it's dying. So the first thing you do is the very last thing you should do, and you water it. And then all that does is it just accelerates the demise of the plant and it rots and it gets thrown out. What you do need to do is basically, as soon as the leaves have gone yellow and they're all wilted, that's great. It's doing what it should do. You need to just dry it off completely you can keep it in a cool basement. You could take it outside and put it under the deck and tip the pot on its side so it doesn't get too wet. But then come September, go and rescue it. Don't water it yet. Take a look and you'll just you'll see little new leaf buds and, and flower buds starting to poke out of the top of the tuber. And at that point, bring it into wherever you want to grow it. Water it. Soak it through at that point, And they'll start growing and then just keep it moist. Um, and you'll get another year out of it, and so on. And some of my cyclamen graecum tubers that I grew um, from the first lot of seeds that I got from friends when I got here in 1995, they're now going on 30 years old. And in the summer, they sit in the greenhouse. They don't get a drop of water from June until the end of September. And they do great. Hmm. And so... My one big success story is buying one from a local supermarket's clearance shelf, not even from the florist section. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. shut right. half dead looking. I think it was a seven inch pot or so. Of mm -hmm. and bought it for 99 cents or a dollar, brought it home. It relieved out immediately, bloomed again, and I've had mm -hmm. it for five years. And benign neglect, I would say, is the number one thing why it succeeded. That's right. As soon as you think it's dying, then basically let it die. Just don't water it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, yeah. It's just going to re-emphasize that the thing cyclamen need in the garden and in and in pots more than anything else is good drainage and some shade. They they're not tolerant of full sun, but um, in the garden, if you have deciduous shrubs or even evergreen shrubs that are limbed up that you can plant them under. They'll, they'll thrive there. They'll thrive, thrive on, um, on slopes. They look fantastic. If you could scatter seeds in amongst rocks, in amongst tree roots, you get the most natural ground cover. Um, and something else that we can talk about, the seeds, when they're ripe, they're spread by ants because the seeds are covered in sugar. And if you let the ants take the seeds back to their nest, they also drop them along the way. You'll, you'll have a natural, very natural spread of uh, cyclamen growing from seed in, in, in no time at all. When we came here, I think I grew about 400 cyclamen hydrofolium from seed, planted them out in their second year in three clumps, maybe a yard across each. And that's turned into an entire hillside of, of 20, 25,000 cyclamen hydrofolium. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of letting the ants do all the labor for you. Yeah, oh, it's, it's great. I was just going to ask for the supermarket varieties or those gift ones. Are those hardy to zone six, seven, eight, or would those not be able to survive out in our winter? 
Oh, I think Zone 8, definitely. They Even in the southeast of England now, they use them as bedding plants, mm-hmm. uh, in, in uh, beds on roundabouts, on roadside verges. So, and they've also bred some varieties which uh, are definitely hardier because Sycamore persicum, which is the parent species of those, uh, grows in the Middle East, but it, it grows at high altitude in the mountains. Um, so they do experience some snow and some frost. So I can let my greenhouse, one of the greenhouses, go down, certainly into the low 20s. And cyclamen persicum in there will survive just fine. And you can get some of the florist cyclamen now, which have been bred, to have a little bit more cold hardiness. So if you if you pick and choose the florist cyclamen, you certainly can, uh, in the kind of the high sevens and the eights, you could absolutely absolutely use them as a, a fall and winter bedding plant. Mm-hmm. Sounds like the perfect plant, as you were saying, for dry shade situations, especially. Um, so good drainage, as you say, the key. So uh-huh. I want to ask about potential pests. Do deer like them? Um, well, we have a, a deer fence around our entire property. So the deer typically don't come in. But I do have some cyclamen outside the fence, and they have never been bothered. And I would say, <clears throat> generally, cyclamen are not bothered by deer. They're very low-growing. Um, I've People ask me that question a lot, and I've talked to people who have high deer pressure, and most of them say that they're not browsed by deer. Occasionally, I'll get a mouse in the greenhouse, mm-hmm. and they don't eat them. They just nip some of the flowers off and it may be in spring that some of the summer the spring flowering ones rabbits may nip some of the flowers off so they're not impervious but they're certainly not um i don't think they're bambi's favorite food i don't think they would be decimated but Mm -hmm. squirrels i've heard a lot that folks have had um especially freshly planted tubers dug up by squirrels and i think Squirrels have a knack of detecting where soil has been disturbed. And so they don't know, oh, John's just planted a cyclamen there, let's go get it. They can actually scent the fact that the soil's been disturbed and they think that they or somebody else has buried a nut and they go investigate. And as a result, the cyclamen gets turfed out or whatever else you've planted. But they don't find the nut and they move on. So if you plant them, I think... For the first few days, A, water them in, because I think that helps to settle the soil down. And then if you've covered them with something just for two or three days, by the time that's gone, I think they no longer detect that anything's been planted and they leave them alone. I don't think they go after the tubers um, per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've did that with other of the small or minor bulbs that I plant is put a window Mm -hmm. screen, like an old window screen over just yeah. because they love that freshly disturbed soil. They don't really That's care right. about the bulbs. They're yeah. just looking to kick something out to put their little nuts in That's and right. store their food for wintertime because you're making it easy for them. The other yeah. thing I do is, I don't know if you've ever tried the red pepper flakes or red pepper spray, um, no, no. kind of dusting the surface with those to discourage them uh, right. from digging. Right. And of course, the best way to... Um, to get around the, the problem of squirrels is to get your cyclamen established, get them seeding around. And it would take a, an army of squirrels to not even make a dent in my population of cyclamen now. So once the cyclamen get going and they're happy, they, they'll just outcompete any foraging by cyclamen or voles or any other critters. Mm-hmm. Squirrels and- or voles, yeah. It does sound like survival of what I call squirrel scaping as well, which is, is so what if the squirrel moves something like <laughs> you right. know, to, from one hole to the other that right. Gets, right. just makes it more interesting. Yep. Yep. Hmm. And so in the greenhouse or in the hardy ones that you're growing in your landscape, are you using any supplements? Um, you were talking about leaf litter for mulching, but like a fertilizer or anything else hmm. to get them going? No, out in the garden, um, other than a covering of shredded leaves, uh, maybe once every year or two, um, I don't feed anything at all in the garden. Um, I don't spray anything. They they really don't get any pests or diseases in the garden. In the greenhouse, I water them with acidified water because um, I find that helps them to with nutrient uptake. 
um, so they don't get chlorotic. There's one, one species in particular will get chlorotic as it gets older. So I, w I do water with acidified water. You don't really have to do that, but it, it helps. And about every third or fourth watering, I do water them with a 20-20-20 fertilizer, which is in the acidified water. And I use a dosatron to dilute the, dilute the feed. Um, but in between waterings, I let them get significantly dry. It's fine to see some wilting and then water them. It's better to do that than, uh, you know, oh, it's Tuesday, it's 10.13 in the morning, it's time to water the cyclamen. So you just need to uh, learn how quickly they dry out, keep an eye on the weather. I standardize my pot sizes and my compost as much as I possibly can. But they were, you know, on a day like today, it's been pure undiluted sun, it's probably close to 70 degrees, the shading's off the greenhouse. I've been in there and they're all wilted, but as soon as the sun goes off them, the soil's moist and they'll pick straight back up. So, you know, there, there is a point of no return and the leaves will yellow and once they've yellowed, you don't want to water them, but that usually doesn't happen until um, certainly in April. So in the growing season, keep them moist, uh, evenly moist, but let them dry out between waterings. Hmm. I like the way you said you were standardizing your pots and the sizing mm -hmm. makes yep. it a lot easier. Are you using terracotta or plastic material for the pots? So, no, that's a good question. In England, I grow all my plants in terracotta pots and I plunge them all in sand benches but here everything's grown in plastic pots and they sit uh, sit on the greenhouse benches in trays they're all very tightly packed which is good because it stops the the roots heating up any more than they need to um, but yeah they're all in plastic and yeah I grow anything the plants I sell I sell out of two and a half inch pots and then I use three and a half inch four and a half inch pots and then I go up into round six up to 14 inch pots for the for the bigger tubers um, you know the, the 30 year old ones i mentioned earlier they get repotted about every five years and the biggest ones now are in 16 inch pots so they're more like tubs than pots hmm. yeah it's so funny to see these tiny little flowers or the small size leaves and then the tuber underneath is like the size of a pumpkin maybe oh yeah they're, they are huge they probably weigh four or five pounds and they're Oh, a good 12 inches in diameter. Yeah, yeah. And so I was going to also note, uh, besides using the plastic pots, is you're using a top dressing for the ones that are in containers. Yes. Is that like a particular type of fine gravel that you're using? So, yeah, and that comes back from my days of growing alpine plants, where a lot of the high alpine cushions, they obviously need moisture in the mix, but they want a very dry crown. And if you put... Um, gravel underneath the crown. When you water them, it helps to keep the crown dry. It helps to dry, helps to dry it out. It keeps weed seeds out. So I've really carried that forward here with the uh, with the cyclamen, and it looks nice as well. So I use um, it's a granite grit. It's made for um, feeding to poultry. There's three grades: starter, grower, and developer. And on my seed pots, I use the grower grade, and on, on any other pots, I use the, the developer grade. And you can buy it from a, a feed and farm store um, for about $12, $12 for a 50-pound bag. And it, it lasts fairly well. And I put about a, a half inch of gravel on the top of every pot. And then underneath that, my growing mix is the same for everything that I grow. And it's a, it's a bagged mix, which is used to be made by Biocomp, it's now made by Good Earth, and it's called BC5, and it's a very free-draining winter mix that's made of composted peanut holes and composted bark. So it, it holds water, it drains really well, it has lots and lots of air space, um, and the plants just love it. So it's uh, if you can get that, I buy it from a wholesaler, um, but I, I'm not sure what I would do if I if I lost access to that because I've I've been using that since we came here and uh, it's a it's a fabulous mix hmm. and it also doesn't degrade because it's fairly large particles so it's not like a peat based mix which after the first year compact so I can leave plants in this mix easily for three or four years and the large particle size means it doesn't all settle down and go anaerobic and squeeze the oxygen out 
um, it, it really keeps its structure very, very well. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a nice mix for rock garden plants and even some orchids. Mm -hmm. Certainly for orchids, yes, absolutely. And really, any woodland plant, I grow all my trilliums. Um, for some plants, I mix it with super coarse perlite, but for things like trilliums, uh, I just use it as it comes out of the bag. So I also like just the look of the top dressing of that gravel. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, very attractive, um, even if it didn't have a practical purpose, the right. top dressing with that. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to do it on some of my house plants, but I have kitties and I feel like that would be tempting fate. <laughs> well, so we, we have three cats and they're, they're, um, they don't use the pots Um to go to the toilet at all, unless, unless I bring, yeah, I bring pots in in the summer for repotting and into the basement, and occasionally a cat gets shut in the basement, and then they will go to the bathroom in the pot. But um, they go in and out the greenhouses, and they they're all over the garden, and they don't tend to do that. So I think that that's something you don't need to worry about because it's a fairly the grade that I use is a fairly heavy gravel, and it's they don't seem to like scratching it. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Yeah, because mine have gotten into just kicking up the pebble trees that I have under some plants. They just okay, okay. love playing yeah. with them. So I can imagine what they would do with some of this. They would just yeah, have yeah. a ball. But <laughs> maybe I'll test some out on that. So our next subject was maybe some companion planting. So you kind of mentioned your trilliums and some of the uh, galanthus, the snowdrops. But yeah. are there other good companion plants for the cyclamen? Yeah, they so smaller smaller hellebores, things like Helleborus niger, work really well. Um, I I do have cyclamen that have self sown extensively in amongst the bigger hybrid hellebores, but they tend to get a little bit lost. But it's fine in the in flower, but it's fine in the winter because I cut all the hellebore foliage down. So um, they will grow with hellebores, but the smaller the better. They look great with things like epimediums. We have hundreds of epimediums in the garden. They, they will work with most small-ish woodland plants. So things like Uvularia, Merivals, um, Claytonia, Spring Beauty, uh, the uh, Erythroniums, the Dog's Tooth Violets, Anemonellas. Um, they look great with trilliums. There's, uh, May apples. There's really not a whole lot that they just they don't work with because virtually all of the things that I've talked about do their thing in spring and summer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whereas the cyclamen really don't start doing their thing until the fall and the winter and the early spring. And it's been a little bit unusual this year because we had late rain, so the garden is greener than it normally is. But usually by the end of the summer, a lot of the herbaceous woodland plants have naturally gone dormant so they go away as the cyclamen come up um, so it tends to be the, the timing and the cycling of the different plants tends to work very well but there's really not much that they uh, they won't work with just things that are bigger and they and they would be overshadowed by are, are things to avoid mm -hmm. yeah and that's a perfect point about the progression so you can get those spring ephemerals coming up just as they are um receding and then mm -hmm. at the end of the season you get that resurgence of the fall winter which when everything else is starting to look not so great in the garden that's when cyclamen really shine right right and, and that's the, the other nice thing is i've got twenty thousand cyclamen hydrofolium in the garden but i don't if they were hellebores i'd have to clean them all up mm. the cyclamen you don't do anything you just they just the leaves go down the leaves rot the tubers sit there and then they come back in the fall. So they are incredibly maintenance-free. That is a great thing to note for all of those of us who love low-maintenance gardening. Uh -huh. And yep. we said we would circle back to a particular cyclamen, I think you said purpurescence, and maybe yeah. finish yeah. out with a little bit on that special plant. Yeah, so as I mentioned, they, virtually all of the cyclamen are on a, they grow in the fall, winter, and spring, and they're dormant in the summer. Uh, Cyclamen purpurescens, it grows in Switzerland and in the mountains of Italy and the French mountains, um, it grows in the Carpathians. It's a higher altitude plant. It grows 
in really, really shady areas and areas that are generally um, moister year round than typical cyclamen habitat. So when we first came over here, I planted a whole bunch of cyclamen purpurescens out in the same way that I would plant them as if I was in England. And you can give them quite a lot of sun in the UK. And lo and behold, they all burnt to a frazzle. It didn't kill them, but it burnt them. So uh, because they, they're evergreen, they make their new leaves in, in late summer, but they keep that set of leaves until the following late summer. And then some or most of those go away, but they've already made a new set of leaves. So they, they're effectively evergreen. And unlike the other species, which flower in fall or late winter, these guys flower in July and August. And some of them are, they have white through really deep magenta flowers, and they have the most amazing scent. So it's a fabulous species. It's not hard to grow, but push it back in the woods, give it more shade, and try and put it somewhere where it's not going to get dust dry. And other than that, they work really well. It's no harder to grow, but don't give it quite the drainage and quite the amount of, of kind of sunny shade that you would give the other species. And it's uh, the leaves, just like all the others, in fact, more so than most of the others, the, the leaf variation, the leaf markings are incredible. They go from pure pewter silver through to dark green, but with everything in the middle. So it's, uh, it's an incredible thing. And that, that's one thing I should say about cyclamen is one of the biggest joys that I get from growing them is growing them from seed. You know, the, the seed is, is ripe in the summer. Um, I harvest it instead of letting the ants get it. I harvest it. I clean it. I sow it in pots before the end of August. Just water it in, cover it with gravel, put it on the greenhouse floor. They're germinating now. I let them grow for a year. They just grow as a single seed leaf the first year. Then at the end of the first year, I pop them up individually. And really from then on, you can start seeing the true character of the leaves. But every single one is different. And it is just unbelievably exciting to see the variation. And I, I must have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of different cyclamen leaves. But every year, I probably find 50 or 60 that... I just have to keep and grow on because they're different or better in some way. So it's uh, the leaves are amazing. You can't divide the tubers. There's not. There's no really useful, meaningful mechanism for propagating them vegetatively. You can't cut them up and divide them. But they're so easy from seed, and that's where all the variation comes from. Hmm. I think you've sold me on a few of those, John. <laughs> <laughs> And definitely can hear your passion for them and yeah. your collecting and why you're obsessed with them. So mm -hmm. how could our listeners find out more or contact you? So I have a website, which is um, edgewoodgardens.net. And on the website, I have about 20,000 photographs of everything I've grown in the garden since about 2000. It needs updating. I'll be doing that in the next few weeks. But... So you can look at individual pictures of, of all the cyclamen in the garden. Um, I do sell plants. I sell them online. Um, you can look at the lists of plants I have available on my website, but you can't order directly from the website. I ask you to email me. Um, I give talks. I take plants to local talks. Uh, I say I can I can send them by email, send them by mail. That's not a problem. Either growing, or preferably when they're dormant in the summer. Um, I have a, a Facebook page, which is just my name, John Lonsdale. And I have an Instagram page, which is Edgewood Gardens. Uh, so you can contact me through info at edgewoodgardens.net. And then I'll, I'll get back to you straight away. And that's the, those are the, the three main mechanisms for communicating with me. Or you can give me a call, uh, 484-678-9856. Well, thanks for sharing that, John. And I think you also do some um, festivals and garden markets. That's, yeah, I do indeed. I forgot that. So especially Pine Knot Farms, uh, Hellebores. That's a big Hellebore nursery in Southern Virginia, right on the Virginia-North Carolina state line. I was just there last weekend. They do a, a fall open house uh, the first weekend of October. And they do two Hellebore open houses the 
two last weekends of February. I'm at all of those and I, I take a huge range of plants to those. And then I go to the Sakonic Garden Plant Fair the first week of May. Um, sometimes go to Stone Crop um, the last week of April. Um, and then Winter Tour has a plant sale, uh, which is usually the middle of March, the Galanthus Gala, um, which some of you may have heard of, um, which was kicked off by David Colt probably six or seven years ago, has turned into a fabulous event. That's always the first Saturday of the Philadelphia Flower Show, so it's usually the first Saturday of March. So I have a lot of plants there, and uh, yep, I'll, I they're, they're the shows that I typically go to every year. Great. I know a lot of listeners who are in the Mid-Atlantic U.S. area will be happy to visit your booth and purchase some directly from you there. That would be great. So, John, any last thoughts for the beginning cyclamen grower uh, that they should keep in mind? Uh, Don't be scared. The The thing I hear more than anything out there is that, oh, I don't grow cyclamen because they're so hard to grow. They are not. They are really, really easy to grow if you just respect the drainage and when they and understand their life cycle and when they're telling you that they want to go to bed and sleep for the summer, you let them. You don't try and keep them awake. But don't be scared. And join there's a there's a society out of England called unusually the Sickleman Society. They have a fabulous bulletin twice a year. Uh, they ship seeds to the United States. They have a fantastic seed exchange. Just get a hold of some cyclamen seeds and try growing them. And if you don't succeed the first time around, keep trying because it's the most rewarding hobby and the most rewarding genus you could possibly grow. Thank you, John. Thank you. Arugula plant profile. Arugula Eruca vesicaria is a cool season edible plant that has a nutty and peppery zing. It is a great addition to salads, on pizza, in sandwiches, or in pasta dishes. It is also known as rocket or colewort. It grows best when planted in the early spring and late summer. Pick a location for them in full sun to part shade. Plant the seeds a quarter inch deep in rich garden soil that is free of weeds or in a large container. The seeds germinate in a week or so. Water them regularly if they do not receive an inch or two of rain per week. After the seedlings are a couple weeks old, you can thin them by snipping out the smaller and weaker ones or gently pulling them out so as not to disturb the roots of the remaining seedlings. The seedlings you removed can be eaten as you would any microgreen. You can harvest the leaves at any stage and keep coming back to harvest more throughout the season. Snip off the biggest outer leaves and let the younger inner leaves keep growing. Do not cut the leaves lower than two inches from the base of the plant or they may not regenerate for you. Once the weather starts to get hot in our region, usually by early June, the arugula plants will bolt, sending up a flower stem and then set seed. Arugula leaves are usually too bitter to eat at this point. Collect these seeds for sowing in the fall, and you can also eat the seeds, adding them to stews and bean dishes. Flea beetles will chew holes in the arugula leaves, So cover them with a garden fabric in spring to prevent the beetles from doing so. You can also use the cover cloth for the fall crop of arugula as extra insulation against mild frosts. Arugula, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, I'm enjoying the blooms of some of those wonderful fall perennials that we discussed on last week's episode of Garden DC, and those include the lovely toad lilies, chrysanthemums, and asters that are blooming in my garden right now. 
over at the community garden. We're preparing for our end of harvest celebration and you all are welcome to join us for that if you are in the Silver Spring, Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. You can see details about that at washingtongardener.blogspot.com. And other local gardening events that you might want to attend include the Ginkgo Fest 2023 on Saturday, October 28th. That's a celebration of Blandy's gloriously golden ginkgo grove. And that is in Virginia at the State Arboretum on the Blandy Experimental Farm. This is 300 trees spanning 3.3 acres and you can get your tickets through eventbrite.com. There's a rain date of Sunday, October 29th. An online event that you might be interested in is the Lessons from an Insect Egg Hunt by Madeline Potter Zoom meeting discussion hosted by the Maryland Native Plant Society, and that's on October 31st at 7 p.m. You can register for free for that at mdflora.org. And Madeline will be sharing her valuable lessons from an insect egg hunt, how to plant selections that impact sustainable control of insect pests. And she's focusing in particular on the brown mammarated stink bug. And then on Wednesday, November 8th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. in person at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland is... A World of Discovery, How Science and Heart Can Make You a More Ecological Gardener. Speaker Nancy Lawson, she's an author, master naturalist, and founder of The Humane Gardener, will be there in person that evening. The event is free, but registration is requested through the Active Montgomery website. Happy gardening! garden lovers this is ray eaton founder of discover garden tours i'm here to invite you all to join us next april and experience the beauty of dutch gardening and horticulture on our discover the netherlands tour please join us and speaker author and social media influencer kathy jentz for this once in a lifetime garden adventure we'll visit private and public gardens flower shows and auctions and much much more highlights include the kuchenhof gardens Hortus Botanicus Leiden, and the Flora Holland Flower Auction. The tour dates are from April 16th through April 25th, 2024. Full details and registration are available on our website at discoverourtours.com. Remember, space is limited, so if you don't want to miss out, I would highly recommend signing up today. We look forward to seeing you in the Netherlands and sharing this unforgettable journey together. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jentz and Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Get low-maintenance alternative salons with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jentz. 
Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer-resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. This is The Last Word on Hostas by Christy Page at Green Prince. I have discovered that my favorite plant to grow is a hosta. This may be primarily because I have not managed to kill it yet, but I think it has more to do with the simple beauty of the plant. I've tried growing many types of flowers over the years. They have not all been failures, but they most definitely have not all flourished. I had rose bushes that were gorgeous for several years until they were invaded by beetles. I had butterfly bushes that were horribly damaged in a storm. Each year, I've planted annuals out front, hoping that they will thrive, only to have them blasted by the sun. About eight years ago, we moved into the home that we're in now. There's a great mix of sun and shade, and all I could think of was the variety of flowers and plants that would be cascading everywhere. I was envisioning my yard as a Monet painting with color. That first year, I bought flats and flats of flowers and plants. I was so happy digging in the dirt and finding homes for my colorful treasures. I lovingly watered, weeded, and waited for my kaleidoscope. It didn't end up as I envisioned. Some areas that I thought were all sun were actually blanketed in shade come afternoon. Areas that I thought would get some sun received almost none at all. I did get some pretty flowers that year, but not the amount I was hoping for. I had done a mix of annuals and perennials, so when fall came, I carefully trimmed back and prepared my gardens for the following spring. To my dismay, once warm weather rolled around, it did not appear that many of my plants had survived. It had been a hard, tough winter, and the fragile blooms were just not able to weather it, or so I thought. Very soon, I started to see green leaves poking up through the ground. What a wonderful sight to behold. Over the weeks, I saw them continue to spread and multiply. The leaves were multi-shades of green, and eventually I saw some flowers emerging from their depths. My hostas had survived. That year, I really learned to enjoy the beauty and the simplicity of hostas. It may not have been the riot of color I was envisioning, but the shades of green had so much depth and warmth. For a few weeks, I had some beautiful blooms, but the green leaves were there for months. I received so much tranquility sitting in the shade, admiring my greenery. Year after year, my hostas have not only grown, they have thrived. They continue to spread and bloom year after year. We've actually even had to do a little strategic replanting, but only when they've started to overtake certain areas of the yard. I don't mind though. I just pick another area where I want to see them flourish. I am so thankful for this lush green plant and the beauty that it has brought into my life. I never really thought of hostas as the perfect plant, but I have discovered that they are the perfect plant for me. This was The Last Word on Hostas with Christy Page at greenprints.com. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast 
is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to WashingtonGardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.